Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Pacific Biosciences stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Pacific Biosciences is a biotechnology company that develops and manufactures systems for gene sequencing, also known as DNA sequencing. The company is headquartered in Menlo Park, California and was founded in 2004. It went public in 2010 and trades on the NASDAQ and Deutsche Börse. In 2010, the Scientist magazine named the company and their first product the top life science innovation of the year. So they were off to a great start. Starting in 2011, it marketed its PacBio RS and PacBio RS2 systems to companies that required gene sequencing technology. At the time, these systems were the most advanced. Its main competitor, Illumina, developed a more efficient process. Illumina actually tried to acquire PAC-B in 2018, but the FTC denied it, saying it violated antitrust laws. PAC-B upgraded its gene sequencing machines a few times in the past few years, adding increased computing power, allowing scientists to sequence DNA quicker, and it was more cost effective than ever. DNA sequencing is expected to be a $40 billion industry by 2030. Sequencing DNA means determining the order of the four chemical building blocks. Those are called bases that make up the DNA molecule. The sequence tells scientists the kind of genetic information that is carried in a particular DNA segment. DNA sequencing is used for a range of things, including diagnosis and treatment of diseases. In general, sequencing allows doctors and scientists to determine if a gene or the region that regulates a gene is linked to a disorder. Identifying the sequence of a person's DNA provides more information to figure out if that person is more susceptible to certain diseases such as cancer and heart disease. With this additional information, doctors can create preventative medicine to help people possibly not get the disease, or if they get the disease, help them live longer, healthier lives. Gathering large amounts of data can help mitigate other diseases as well. You may be more familiar with DNA in saliva, fingerprints, or hair being used to catch criminals, which it has been successful with in the past. DNA has not only caught criminals, but it was the main reason it freed people who were wrongfully convicted of a crime. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 5.8 billion market cap. They're trading at $29 a share and they have 198 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they did have positive free cash flow in 2020, negative in the other years. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that's also positive in 2020, negative in the other years. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that's up and down, 80 million to 90 million to 80 million back to 90 million. You may think 90 million dollars is a lot of sales, but relative to its market cap, it's pretty low. You'll see this when we look at the price to sales ratio later. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit which was the highest in the trailing 12 months at 38 million. Below that is operating expenses, and this is mainly research and development. So their operating expenses are higher than their gross profit, so they have negative operating income every year. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt, which was 1.8 million in the trailing 12 months. Then below that is other income and expenses. And that's why they had positive net income in 2020, this 134 million of other income and expenses. When Illumina tried to acquire this company in 2018, the FTC denied the acquisition, saying it violated antitrust laws. When a company violates antitrust laws, that means it may become a monopoly and be able to force other companies out of the industry and have significant pricing power over its customers. Pacific was really smart. They wrote into the agreement that if the acquisition doesn't go through, they would get a $98 million payment. 
Since the acquisition failed, Illumina had to pay Pacific $98 million of cash. That's why they had so much in other income and expenses, and that brought their net income to positive. But I would focus on operating income when I look at the income statement. The stuff in other income and expenses is not recurring. Especially in this situation, I don't think they're going to be getting future termination fees from failed acquisitions. This is the first time I've ever seen this. Because when a company makes money or loses money outside of its core operations, it still needs to report that on its income statement, but it goes into other income and expenses. So that's why I would usually ignore these items and focus on operating income. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses or generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. So they had negative operating cash flow every year except in 2020. Their capex is pretty low because they don't spend much in capital expenditures. Most of their money is in research and development. The genome sequencing machines they sell are not part of CapEx. CapEx are machines that are used to make products, not the actual products themselves. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow, and that's negative most years. So they issue a lot of capital stock to fund their business. They issued over 100 million in 2018 and 230 million in 2020. Every time a company issues capital stock, that increases the shares outstanding, making your shares less valuable. It's better to issue capital stock because when you issue debt, you have to pay the interest payments on your debt. And they don't have any profits at this point. So in order to pay the interest payments, they have to issue more debt. Let's look at their capital structure. 281 million of equity, 937 million of debt. They're 23% equity, 77% debt. Here is their balance sheet. And as of 1231.20, they only had $42 million of debt. And then it jumped way up to $936 million in the first quarter of 2021. They sold $900 million of convertible debt to a subsidiary of SoftBank. So they received the $900 million in cash. And if the stock price goes up to $43.50, that convertible debt converts to equity. And they don't have to pay off the debt. They do have a 1.5% interest payment on the debt. If the stock price doesn't hit $43.50 by 2028, then they have to buy back the debt for 900 million plus all the interest payments they paid. This is a big benefit when a stock price gets inflated like AMC did. So if the company had convertible debt, all that debt would convert to equity. So the company would get rid of a lot of debt off its balance sheet, which in turn lowers the interest payments on their debt. So that's a big benefit when these meme stocks get inflated. Also, another big benefit is the company can issue stock at the inflated stock price. Those are the two main benefits when a stock price gets inflated. Although that's not the case with this company, it's not a meme stock. The stock has increased a lot the past few months. We'll look at that in a little bit. Their net debt is negative 224 million. So they could pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have 224 million dollars of cash left over. Their weighted average cost of capital is a blend of the cost of equity and cost of debt, and that's 9.5%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four. That's $6.5 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $4.9 billion. We divide that by 198 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $25. They're trading at 29, so they're trading at a 19% premium. It's a sell according to the model. The way I valued this company, I looked at their main competitor, Illumina. Illumina had $890 million of free cash flow in 2020. My prediction, if everything goes right, they'll have about half of that by 2024. The free cash flows before that were the appropriate amounts that would lead up to $445 million. But as you know, you can make a lot of money on a stock before the company makes any money. If you buy the stock and they're still losing money, but the stock price goes way up because people feel the future of the company is going to be amazing, you could sell the stock at a big profit. And if the company never makes a profit, eventually the stock price would go down to zero. But if you sold before it went down, you could still make a lot of money. On the flip side, you could lose a lot of money on a company that's making a lot of money. 
So it's really difficult trying to figure those things out, market sentiment and momentum and price fluctuation. It could take a really long time to try to figure that out. I try not to time the market, I just buy and hold. Before analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $52, the low was 45, the high was 62. So analysts appear really bullish on this stock. This is a stock price since it started trading in 2010. So you can see it started out at about $14, $15 a share. Usually a stock price is pretty high when it starts and then after a few months it goes down as this did. Then it was pretty steady for about a decade. It did go up and down, but it didn't move too much it looks like. Then at the end of 2020, the stock really shot up. A big reason was people thought this company can help cure COVID. The only way to cure a disease or figure out why certain people are worse off when they get a disease is genome sequencing. And that's exactly what this company does. This is a stock price the last 12 months. So it was around $8 a share 12 months ago. And then it was really driven up due to the excitement of this company and this industry. And then the bulls got in, started shorting the stock. A lot of people sold off and the stock price has come down to $29. But even if you bought it one year ago, you could have more than tripled your money. Even if you didn't sell when it peaked at about $50, you could have still made a really nice return. Or if you're still holding, you'd be up a lot on your investment. If of course you purchased before the big run up. DNA sequencing was an $11 billion market in 2020. It's expected to more than double by 2028. So this is a big market and there's not a lot of players in this market. So this company can do really well if its machines prove to be successful. And this stock is a little more volatile than the market. It has a beta of 1.13. The stock has went up almost seven times in the past 52 weeks while the S&P 500 went up 39%. The 52 week low was 335, the high was 54. The stock is trading below its 200 day, but above its 50 day moving average. When the 200 day moving average crosses above the 50 day moving average, which this has, that's called the death cross. That's a bearish signal. About two to three million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 198 million shares outstanding, 187 million are on float. When a share is on float, that means it's available for investors like me and you to purchase. The 11 million shares that are not on float are held by insiders and cannot be purchased. Institutions appear bullish on the stock. They own 85% of the company. Institutions are mutual funds, hedge funds, large entities like that. It has a pretty high short rate. Nearly 9% of the shares on float are shorted. This stock has done really well in the past year and past three years, up over 700%, much more than its industry and the market. Although in the past five years, this stock is up similar to its industry, but about double the market. And you can see how much this stock has been moving the past 90 days, down 14%, the past 30 days up 31%, and the past seven days up 12%. So pretty big swings on this stock. So if you're a day trader, you could have made a lot of money or lost a lot of money on this stock. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to decrease 14%, its industry to increase 11%, and the market to increase 16%. Analysts are forecasting their revenue to grow 31%, its industry 8%, and the market 9%. So analysts are predicting their revenue will grow a lot, but their earnings will go down because it's really expensive to grow this type of company and they're not getting close to break even. When economies of scale set in and they hit break even, then the growth will grow really fast. But until that happens, they're gonna be losing money. In the past five years, their annual earnings increased 4%, its industry 20% and the market 12%. In the past year, their earnings decreased 13%, its industry increased 34% and the market 21%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, for the first nine plus years, you would have been in the red and you probably would have got discouraged and sold. But if you would have held on, you'd be at $25,000 today. That's a 10% annual return. The biggest shareholder is Kathy Wood's ARK Investment at 11%. Then the next biggest is Vanguard. They're the largest provider of mutual funds in the world and the second largest provider of ETFs. The third biggest is BlackRock. They're the world's largest asset manager. Then Jackson Square Partners. They're an investment boutique in San Francisco. Then Capital Research owns 6% of the stock. It has $2 trillion of assets on the management. 
Let's look at their financial ratios. The average PE in the market is 33. The median is 22. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have negative net income because their expenses are higher than their revenue. So we can't look at the PE. Their price of sales is 63, which is much worse than the market median average. That means investors are paying $63 for $1 revenue. So their revenue is really bad relative to their market cap. Their price to book is 21, which is worse than the market median and average. They have negative ROIC, negative interest coverage ratio, and negative ROE. They have a ton of current assets relative to their current liabilities. They have over $1.1 billion of cash on their balance sheet. That's mainly from the $900 million from the convertible debt they sold recently. They did have negative $80 million of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, $1.2 billion of working capital, working capital's current assets minus current liabilities. So they have almost $1.1 billion of funding. So they have a lot of money to grow their business, whether through research and development, or they can acquire other companies. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos on BioNanoGenomics, Illumina, Precipio, and Sensionics, all in the same industry as Pacific. If Pacific has a number in red, they're worse than the industry average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. Four of the five companies in this industry have negative earnings. Only Illumina has positive earnings, and their earnings are pretty weak relative to their market cap, 97 PE ratio. Everybody's price to sales in this industry is pretty weak. Pacific does have a better price to book than average. They have a really high current ratio. They're the second biggest company on this list at 5.8 billion market cap. Illumina is the biggest, they're 10 times bigger than Pacific, and nobody pays a dividend. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 19% premium. They're in an important industry. A lot of money will be pumped into what they're doing because it's so important to cure diseases, find the reasons why certain people are more affected with certain diseases, and a host of other things. This industry isn't too crowded because it's really difficult for a company to be successful. You need a lot of really smart people to understand this. It's not a logistics type business where you could just build a factory and pump out products. It takes a lot of time and expertise to master DNA sequencing. But it seems like they have a good foundation, so I think there's a good chance they will become successful. But only time will tell. I rank their free cash flows 1 out of 10, their revenue 4 out of 10, and their ratios 2 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.